Like I've said, I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, and uh, I want to give a little background on this talk. I gave this talk, like a um, sort of modified version of this talk, maybe six or eight months ago to the internal company. And if you ask, you know, there's various medium employees in and about the crowd. And if you ask them what they remember about that talk, they'll tell you that I introduced many of these concepts using internet cats. Um, because I love cats, and that's mostly the reputation that I've gotten at this company. Um, so when I was putting together this presentation, I asked my wife, hey, should I include cats to explain these concepts? And she was like, eh, I don't know. Um, so, uh, but we decided I would pull the audience. So do people here like cats? I mean, is that like, is that like a good thing? All right, cats, all right, all right. Well, maybe you guys will see some cats in this presentation. All right. OK, so what's on the agenda? I did include some comics, because everyone loves XKCD. Um, yeah, so I'll try to not show you random slides and have them make sense. All right, so I'm going to sort of reiterate what Ev talked about that Medium is doing, uh, give you some technical overview about how we're solving our big data problems, uh, an overview about our big data platform, version one, version two, uh, what we learned in between, a little bit about our ML platform built on Scala, all the, all the big data platform ML platforms built on Scala, uh, what's in store for the future, and I will do my best to answer any of your questions. Uh, if you have a question, just shout it out, and I will stop talking and try to answer. All right, so what do we do at Medium? All right, well, so like I've said, there are people out there that want to consume written content uh, in cat form, and people who want to produce written content, and Medium is sitting in between these two trying to match them. And on the back side, we would like to pay writers for their excellently produced content. <clears throat> so where does big data and ML fit in all of this situation? Uh, so first, like Ev was talking about, we have a recommendation system to match readers with the content that they'll like from our writers. Um, we have pipelines to automatically annotate and categorize content coming onto the platform. And this is kind of where we mix machine learning and human intelligence um, together. And we have uh, ETL platforms, or sorry, ETL pipelines to support some of our external facing use cases, such as paying out writers. Um, and we have a bonus use case where we're using ETL pipelines to measure how well we're doing. Uh, this is a cat representation of Gustav, Medium's head of product science. I did get his permission to post his cat likeness on the slide, so no worries there. All right, technical overview. So here we go. <clears throat> so at a 10,000 foot view, this is what we're doing at Medium. Uh, we have Spark code, and I'll get into that in a moment, why we chose Spark. Uh, and our engineers will submit that to our CI server. That will build the code, post it to our hosted file store. Actually, I think I have. Yeah, there we go. Uh, submits it to the CI server. It goes on our hosted file store. Uh, we have a cron that kicks off and submits a job to our Spark cluster. And then our Spark cluster is reading and writing to our various data stores that we use. All right, so why did we choose Spark? Uh, so actually, uh, Alexi asked me this question in the little interview that we had before this talk. And really the answer is that first bullet point there. You know, uh, I know Medium has a brand and we're, you know, we're known in the world, but we're actually you know, still a fairly small startup. And so we're having to rely a lot on uh, our in-house expertise. So we had people in-house that knew Spark, and so we had to rely on what we knew. So, uh, so that was one of the big reasons, um, you know. And then the following, the bullet points after that are, you know, also true. It's a generic framework that covers our use cases. It's industry hardened, um, and it has uh, 
integrations with the data stores that we use. So that's great. Okay, so people always ask us, you know, why did you choose Scala? Um, but it's really for similar reasons. We had in-house expertise on Scala, so we chose to use it. And of course, it's a first class citizen on Spark, which was a choice that we had just made. So in-house expertise, great. Uh, AWS. So this was a third choice that we made to launch our stuff on AWS in EMR. Can anyone guess why we did this? Manage Spark, yeah, that's true, but in-house expertise. <laughs> but yes, uh, so, uh, and then all the nice things about Amazon, low bootstrapping, low bootstrapping costs, uh, available support, and we run a ton of stuff on AWS, so we really like it. DevOps loves it. Um, so, so yeah, that's why we chose EMR. Uh, another interesting choice that uh, we sometimes talk about is we decided against using streams, at least in V0, and that's again for business reasons, not necessarily technical reasons. Uh, bulk turns out covers most of the use cases that we have at the company, or at least gets us 80% of the way there. Um, we are on occasion running backfills of our data, uh, which can be difficult over streaming. Um, we, our recommendation system, like Ed was talking about, is not quite to the Facebook and Twitter scale yet. So streaming has less value for us. Um, and like that last bullet point said, we just don't have the engineering resources to go attack that problem right now, although we are hiring, so maybe that will change. Um, okay, so taking all that together, uh, we set about to make a data platform, and here is the best XKCD platform cartoon that I could find, which I thought was pretty appropriate. Um, all right, so one thing that we did was we combined our CI and cron server together, and that just made it one less moving part. We used Jenkins, again, in-house expertise, um, and so that's great. So we submit our Spark code to Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins serves as our cron server as well. It's reading from our stateful cron database, posting to our file store, which is S3, I can tell you, and then kicking off our jobs in our Spark cluster. Um, and I'll also point out for our MVP, uh, just in case people are curious, we actually were, we cut out EMR altogether and we were just running Spark, our Spark cluster locally on Jenkins. So it was actually quite a beefy, um, beefy worker cluster there. All right, in terms of the Spark cluster that we were, that we were using, uh, we set up what we term now as static clusters per environment. So we had three basic um, profiles, uh, dev, pre-release, and prod. And so we just had static EMR clusters that uh, ran and we submitted jobs over Jenkins and via cron. So that was all great. And of course this is a Scala meetup so I would be remiss if I didn't put some Scala code into my presentation. Uh, so what did we do? Uh, we relied heavily on utilities and mixins. Um, so we treated each job as a separate application. So you can see this is an object. Uh, that medium job base class actually had the main method, uh, and we had a very small, small Spark uh, wrapper around Spark submit uh, that was written in Python. So the cron would run the Python, which would call Spark submit uh, with the R Spark jar on its class path, and it would call uh, the our job, our Scala job. Uh, so in this little example, we are matching cats to people who love them and want to adopt them. So you might see this example in other slides in the presentation. Um, okay, so mixins provided functionality through inheritance, and uh, we had utilities available to help extract and load the data frames that we had. Okay, great. <clears throat> so, 
As you can imagine, there were quite a number of problems. Uh, so I'll highlight a couple of them. Uh, one, uh, we did build in a mechanism to create dependencies between jobs. So a pipeline would you know, extract and load, and then a downstream pipeline would extract from those results and load again. And sometimes we would go two, three, four levels deep into that DAG, but we forgot to build a visualization tool to manage that, which turned out to be pretty bad because, as you can imagine, something upstream would fail, that would have cascading failures across our system, and we, no one would know what was going on until we dove into Jenkins and looked at the cron. So, not a good situation. Um, and as you might imagine, because we were running these static clusters and we had lumped our jobs together, uh, we were always running the risk of cascading failures because we didn't have enough isolation in our cluster setup. So this was also a problem. In terms of Scala, we had some more problems. Um, one, uh, as you guys might know, Spark has this pretty nice feature where you can run locally and, uh, and it makes it very easy to set up unit testing. But since everything was happening through mix and inheritance, it was basically impossible to unit test any of this stuff without an actual database connection. So we were sort of flying blind as we were developing these things, just submitting it to production, uh, going through logs, trying to debug, and then rinse and repeat. Okay, so that was a big problem. <clears throat> Two, uh, we found that people were constantly reinventing the wheel when they were going to extract data from our data stores. And this was particularly bad because uh, Medium is not a Scala shop by nature. We're actually, most of our people know JavaScript. So people were hunting about our jobs and doing a lot of co co copying and pasting, um, which sort of was bloating our code base. And the data platform team was sort of losing control of what was going on. And we're having to support all these scenarios that people were hacking together. So uh, this is really, really bad. OK. So uh, we sort of gathered up all these problems. And we made a spreadsheet. And we went for version two. Uh, and this was maybe about six months ago. OK, so version two. I'm gonna, this is going to get deeper into the Scala code uh, here, too. OK, so one thing we did was we started doing better isolation on our Spark clusters. So we sort of defined some verticals. We had tier one vertical. We had ML vertical. Uh, we had a, a Dynamo vertical where we're doing extraction and loading from our Dynamo instance. Um, and we set up clusters around that. So that's great. So more isolation means that we're uh, less at risk of cascading failure. Great. Uh, we also turned on a, a dynamic feature in EMR so that the clusters could elastically expand and uh, retract based on the usage. And so that just made the whole thing more stable. And we were dealing with a lot less uh, you know, pager duty. So that was great. Um, and we actually went one step further. And we turned on what we call transient dynamic clusters, which is another feature on EMR, um, which allows us to spin up instantaneous clusters per job. So now we have ultimate isolation uh, we're really not afraid of cascading failures anymore, so that's great. Um, and what's even better is as Amazon is releasing uh, newer and newer versions of Spark, we can safely spin up uh, transient clusters to go test, to test features in those versions. Uh, so this has been really, really great. Um, we have actually a couple of pipelines that are running on older versions of Spark that we can't quite migrate yet because of some Spark bugs. And this feature has saved us because we can isolate those totally into their own cluster. Um, and it's, it's really fantastic. 
Um, the one downside of this is it can be super slow to create these, especially if you're trying to rapidly iterate uh, for development purposes. And I'm going to talk about that in uh, a little bit. We have some plans to address that, actually. Um, OK, so like I said, we didn't build any dependency management or visual visualization, which I would recommend against. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in version two, we sort of got a little more serious about this. So we built an in-house visualization tool to examine uh, the execution DAGs. Uh, and this has been a lifesaver because we can, anytime a job's failing, we can go view the execution DAG and see if there's upstream jobs failing and if that's having a cascading effect. So that's great. And we even have uh, a little static checking at the CI level. So we will make sure that you, your DAGs are correct uh, before they go into production. Uh, and we have cascading failures indicated. Great. OK. So, so we set up some of that stuff, and that made things a lot more stable. Uh, but we still kind of had this problem where we had non-Scala experts wanting to write Scala code and sort of doing the copy-paste thing and losing control of uh, how the system. We were, as the data platform team, we were kind of like, we couldn't keep control of how the platform is being used. Um, so what we did is we sort of sat down and we examined like, OK, what is the anatomy of an ETL job? All right, well, just the, the acronym ETL sort of lays it out for you. Like, first we're extracting, then transforming, then loading. Uh, and more to the point, extraction and loading have configuration that we need to inject. So we said, OK, as the data platform team, what if we just sort of commoditized extraction and loading as services so that those are generally available to everyone? And then what people in the company will do is concentrate on just data transformations, which when you think about it, is really the meat of what they're trying to do, the jobs that they're trying to get done. So this kind of provides this nice dichotomy where the platforms team is doing um, just sort of, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, uh, boilerplate work. And people don't have to like worry about tuning Spark and configuring Spark and, and how all that works. And they can really zoom in on like the business logic that they, they want to produce to get the job done that they need to get done. Um, and so sort of to wrap this up in a statement, uh, as a data platform team, we would provide extraction and loading as services uh, instead of those being like controlled by developers in the company. Okay, so, so to do this, we sort of went from the inheritance model into the composition model, and um, we did it with uh, dependency injection. So here is our cat owner matching job sort of reimagined with composition. Uh, we have a separate entry point for job execution. And I'll tell you why this is important later. Um, so all your extraction and loading functionality is provided through composition uh, by injected services. So that's great. Um, we had this idea of doing self-documenting mixins uh, for configuration, uh, taking advantage of polymorphism here. And so that made it, uh, that made our data extraction and data loading very, very type safe. So that was awesome. And it had some other benefits, which I'll talk about in a couple slides. Um, but most importantly, what this did was it made the methods that we were producing as a data platforms team extremely easy to understand. So when a non-Scala engineer started typing in their ID and said data loader dot, and it would, it would auto-complete with extract S3, extract Dynamo, extract Redshift, 
This made it very, very clear what was uh, going on, what methods they needed to call to get their work done. Um, and then the, in the data loader service, we were actually loading, uh, we would allow uh, developers to specify all the destinations for their data. So, and we would handle that all at once in one shot. So this was great. Um, so in terms of, so when we started diving down deeper, uh, we wanted to make sure that we built a platform that was extensible because we, we couldn't anticipate all the use cases um, and all the data stores that we were going to use. So we decided to do this through uh, plugin architecture. So if you consider the data extractor and data loader as services that were getting injected into your job, behind those services, we were going to build plugins. Um, so these are actual plugins that we have today on the platform. Uh, we might, uh, and I think this, this is pretty much it. Uh, we might have one more loader plugin actually. Um, but the data platforms team actually produced all these plugins which, which enabled this functionality to all the engineers across the company. Um, but more importantly, it also uh, sort of provided a uh, an extensible framework so that if there was a business case to add another uh, load destination or another extraction destination or source, uh, that was very, very easy to do. Um, so there are 18 point-to-point -point combinations. Uh, we don't use all 18. <clears throat> uh, okay, so what did that look like in Scala code? So, uh, so we started sort of at this service definition level by uh, defining a Scala trait here. And uh, like I said, we, we concentrated very hard on naming the methods in a way that would make sense to someone who wasn't uh, familiar with big data or familiar with Scala. So here we go. We're creating the data loader plugin. We're gonna load an RDD. Uh, it's going to have a destination, uh, an RDD based on uh, protobuf messages and uh, save mode. Pretty simple to understand. Um, and here is the uh, example Redshift implementation for that plugin. Uh, this is actually code that I copied out of our code base, um, but I tried to obfuscate some of the implementation details. Um, and that simply uh, implements the plugin. And then uh, one of the things we used was this, these auto bind annotations. And so what that did for us was um, it allowed us, so the whole thing is based on uh, Google Juice to, do, to run the injection. And uh, these annotations is like a, a very thin layer over Juice that, um, that allows for dynamic class pass scanning. So when the, application starts up, the, the application being the, the ETL job itself, when that starts up, we'll scan the class path. Uh, that will inject all the services using juice. And, oops. Um, actually, I have it in the next slide. Uh, and so that injects all the services using juice, and you can inject those directly into your job and use them. Um, and uh, what's great about this, if you can see, we can inject, uh, because the pipelines themselves run as separate applications. We can inject uh, pipeline level uh, configuration through Juice as well. So you can see like the pipeline name um, and the import ID is a sharding mechanism that we use at Medium um, for our pipelines. Uh, so, right, so at the service level, how do we use these plugins? Um, we define our, here's our definition of a data loader. Um, again, we're exposing uh, the singleton using these annotations, and we're exposing them using the data loader trait. So that's great. Um, and abstracts away all the details of the data loader from the job author. Um, and then, as we saw on the slide before, that gets directly injected into the job itself. So it becomes very, very easy for someone to write a ETL job. Um, okay, so let's do a time check. Um, 
so one of the big problems we had, like I said, was testing. And one of the awesome things about doing composition with dependency injection is it totally opens up our ability to test this stuff. Um, so since the extraction and loading pieces are now platform pieces, uh, we're telling job authors, you can trust these. These are well-authored, stable pieces that you can rely on. So um, let's divide and conquer as a testing strategy. So we're actually going to isolate your data transformation piece, and we're going to surround that uh, with what we call a mocking data extractor, which means we're going to mock out the data through uh, Spark data frames that your job uses. You can run that through your real transformation code, and then we will give you what we call an asserting data loader, which will simply assert your transformations at the very end. Um, so this is a kind of a dense slide, but this is what it looks like in Scala code. If uh, we were testing our cat owner matching job. Um, oh yeah, we wrote a little wrapper around uh, uh, the spark. Um, so, okay, where was I? Oh yes, so here we are mocking, like I said, we're mocking out our, um, our data frames. Um, we're saying that the mock source is S3 so that the job recognizes it as such. And then we're going to assert the uh, loaded results uh, in our asserting data loader. And uh, yay, dependency injection. So what this line right here is saying is we're going to, we actually create a, a service injector um, we do the class path scan and we grab, we create the actual graph of our services. And then we override uh, the extractor and loader within that graph. So we can like, we can sort of pinpoint the services that we're trying to mock in the graph. Uh, this is actually a key part of this testing framework because it means we don't have to mock every single service in the graph. Like we can rely on Juice to create the full graph and just mock the services that we, we care about in the test. Um, so okay, what are, the, what are kind of the general results of this? Uh, well, we started to see more and better testing and we started to invest more and more in testing jobs before they got to production. So we were going to catch uh, logic errors and before we even release them to our CI server, because we can run these locally. Uh, and certainly our CI server acted as a safety net backup so that we weren't going to uh, release regressions into production. So that was great. Uh, number two, uh, as a data platform team, we started to get tighter control over the elements that we were producing. Uh, so we had, uh, like you saw in the trace that we were defining, we had uh, very specific contracts with uh, job authors. Uh, this is what, how, you, how you use these services. This is what you can expect from these services. And so when there was a change to those contracts, uh, those changes were managed. And we can communicate those out effectively to the rest of the company. Uh, so because of that, we started to see more engagement across teams. Um, one of the best compliments I've ever gotten in my entire career was, um, one of our engineers looked at me and said, you've made Spark programming fun, which was something I never expected that I would hear to hear, but, um, but I was thankful. And uh, you know, in my next one-on-one, -on -one, I was like telling my boss that was the greatest compliment I've ever had in my career. But, uh, but I kind of agree with him. Like, this has kind of made Spark programming fun because we've taken out all the, uh, all the nuanced spark stuff that you have to beat your head against the wall to get right. And we've allowed people to just concentrate on doing transformations and solving business problems. Um, and we even found that there are some non-programmers that started getting into the act and um, like, you know, playing around with the, with the um, 
with the framework that we had built. And um, you know, Gustav was was one such guy, and um, and so we were very flattered that uh, that we were uh, influencing even non-programmers in the company to to try stuff out. Um, so kind of once we started settling the big data question, especially around Scala, uh, we decided to take it one step further because uh, like I was mentioning, we had some ML use cases that we wanted to go address. Um, so we sort of took the same approach. Okay, uh, whereas before we were talking about the anatomy of an ETL job, now we were, we were thinking through the anatomy of supervised classification. Uh, so kind of at a very, very high level, um, supervised classification, you take your training data, you extract all your features, you assemble them into a nice vector, and you build a model. Then you take your unlabeled data, you do the exact same thing, uh, you apply your model to your assembled feature vector, and that produces results. Uh, then you evaluate you can evaluate those results with machines and humans. And from human evaluation, you can create a feedback loop into your training data, which in theory will make your model better, uh, which will make your evaluation better, and the whole thing proceeds from there. So we kind of went through the same exercise, like I said. And we said, hey, uh, maybe people shouldn't have to worry about how to assemble their feature vectors and evaluate their models and build their models. Like maybe that's something that we can provide for them as a service. Um, and instead, they can concentrate on finding data that's going to be representative of the problem that they're trying to solve. And, uh, and extracting their features. And this one I kind of, it's sort of half purple, half orange because uh, there's some infrastructure work that I'm about to show you that we did to sort of make their jobs easier. But in the end, really what we're asking people to do to solve these types of problems is find training data and decide what features you want to extract. And the platform kind of takes care of the rest of, uh, the, rest of the problem. Okay, uh, so this is kind of a high level view of how the feature assembly works. Um, like I said, the, your Spark job is gonna uh, extract your training set. Uh, we have what we call a metadata store, which injects uh, metadata about your entities into a series of feature extractors. Those extract features into their data frames. We join, then we join against your training set, and we have a labeled feature vector that we can pump through a model builder. Um, so looking at the Scala code, you're, this is gonna look very familiar because uh, you know, the, the, the pattern, we were just reapplying this pattern that we had built with our ETL jobs. Uh, so let's define a service for feature extractors. Um, this is a global definition. Um, and then what we said is, okay, even though we have this global definition of a feature extractor, uh, each job is going to have very specific needs for the types of features that it wants to extract. So we're going to allow for a local definition of a feature extractor that's a tied to a specific job. Uh, this is real code that I've copied out of our code base. This is the feature extraction definition for our intrinsic quality ranking job, um, which as you imagine tries to rank posts based on their intrinsic quality. Um, and then we implement our local feature extractor uh, using a, a local service implementation. So in this case, we are going to extract intrinsic features from the title of our post. And that's going to become part of our vector, which is going to be used to build our model. Uh, and then that whole loop proceeds from there. Uh, as you can see, the the annotation, the, the auto binding annotation is slightly different. Uh, we're auto binding this in a set of services instead of as a singleton. So that set will get uh, injected into the juice graph. And then we'll run through all the feature extractors, extract all the features, build the vector, et cetera. Um, okay, so similar thing with the feature assemblers, the global definition, uh, a local definition. 
uh, which basically just sort of defines the entities that we're trying to classify and injects all the feature extractors that we've built on the previous slide. Uh, so this is the definition of the intrinsic quality feature assembler that we have. Um, and then there you go. Our ranking job uh, can use our feature assembler. And I uh, actually didn't put the call in here. But there's a very simple method call that just simply says, uh, assemble your features. And the system will run through all the feature extraction, feature assembly. Um, what I don't have in the slides, we, we actually did build a model. We, we use these same similar concepts to build services to build models as well. And that's uh, basically a thin wrapper around Spark's MLlib. Um, OK. So how are we doing on time? Oh, pretty good. OK, so I just have a couple of slides um, to talk about what's in store for the future. And then I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, OK, so like I said, um, in terms of our cluster, uh, we've gotten a lot of mileage over um, our dynamic clusters and even our transient dynamic clusters. But one thing that we, uh, the data platforms team has done is partner with our DevOps team, which is evaluating Kubernetes right now. And we want to do what we were calling transient dynamic clusters with pump priming, which means that we're going to keep a floating pool of free resources, and we can instantaneously sign up a cluster. Um, the hope here is that our clusters are much faster to sign up, and the development iterations can become much, much faster. Um, uh, so we're going to invest a little bit more in dependency management. This is a really, really important piece. Um, so I talked about sort of the upstream views that can show cascading failures. We're going to be adding a downstream view that shows the impact of failures downstream. Uh, we're adding manual retries for our DevOps rotations uh, so that there's a single button press when you're paged at 3 AM. Uh, we're doing stuff like better access to logs. Um, and I should say, this, is, this has been built in-house kind of as a bare bones thing to get us off the ground. Uh, but we're also interested in perhaps implementing uh, a system that does you know, real, real serious dependency management, stuff like uh, Airflow out of Airbnb. Um, so that's in the future, potentially. Um, one of the things that's near and dear to my heart, actually, is this idea of um, auto-deploying machine learning models. And sort of the, the rough idea would be, once you build the model, um, you sort of you, uh, you run the model on a subset of your unlabeled, or you run the model on a subset of your data, you evaluate the results, and if the results are good enough, you auto-release the model. Um, that's sort of a very high level description of that. Um, but right now, uh, the way we release models is, is extremely manual. Uh, the way we select features is extremely manual. Uh, we'll program them, we'll run the model, we'll look at our results, and we'll kind of make a, a judgment call whether those results are good or not. And if they're good enough, we'll release the model. Uh, so we're hoping to sort of tighten up that loop and make this a more automated process. Um, and finally, uh, one of the things that we're sort of dabbling in is this idea of rapid prototyping of ML models. Um, uh, as you guys might know, as I'm sure you guys know, uh, Python is like a preeminent language in developing machine learning models. And um, sort of one of our theories is where it shines is in this idea of rapid prototyping. So you can get in there, you can sign your features, you can build a model, you can test it very, very quickly. Um, so we've been sort of thinking about and prototyping ways to maybe uh, do a little bit more science in Python to allow us to get to a result faster and then productize that in Scala um, to sort of take advantage of all this platform stuff that we've been working on. Um, 
So that's really the end of my presentation. Um, the, I, you know, I kind of want to highlight those future slides, sort of the things that we're working on over the next quarter and the next year, because Medium is hiring. Um, uh, these are some of the open roles that we have. Uh, we, have um, we have recruiters in the audience, and we have uh, Brian is back here, and uh, guy right, waving his hand, and John over here. These are heads of engineering, so uh, I'm sure they'd love to talk to you if you're interested in coming to work for Medium. And I am happy to talk to you as well, if you would like. Um, so with that, I will open the floor to any questions. I will do my best to answer them. Um, I will say that I finished this slide deck at 2 o'clock this morning, um, so I'm a little, little tired. And when I finished, the only person left awake in my house was my cat. So I took a celebratory selfie with my cat to celebrate the end of these slides. And so I will show that picture to you now. There it is. And his name is Sam. So thank you very much for listening. <clears throat> Um, as you can tell, he was quite pissed. <laughs> so, yes? Um, so I'm, I'm curious about um, extractors and loaders. So what do they do that, like, data sets can So I understand that you can read formats, different formats, but I saw your S3 plugin, so that means that and this uh, data set can, can read directly from S3, right? So what's in, in the extractor that, that is? Right, so, got it. So if I could summarize your question, like sort of. Sorry. Uh, the summary to your question is, or to summarize your question, what, what are we adding on top of Spark within that extractor? Um, so the answer is configuration, really, right? So I, I mean, we needed a way for people to easily and smartly configure, like, for example, um, the bucket that we were going to go fetch the data from, right? Uh, we actually run uh, dev uh, pre-release production instances. So we needed a convenient way to, like, uh, I actually didn't get into configuration in this presentation, but we wanted sort of like a one-stop shop configuration marker. So you're making the job environment independent, right? So exactly. Job can run in Exa yeah, so exactly. That, that's sort of one thing that falls out of this. Um, uh, and, you know, it's sort of a, it's a separation of concerns, right? Like if we can, if we can abstract away all the configuration, people can just concentrate on the job on um, the data transformations. And, and then the added benefit, like I talked about with testing, is now you can inject uh, mocked uh, data sets into a test and run through the transformation to test your logic. Yes? Uh, I got two related questions. The same thing with the plugin. Looks like for, for Spark, you can easily take the JSON or CSV files. And these are formats pretty standard. Yes. So it's really, your different data sources, it's really just a different downloads, which is, have nothing to do with the ingestion part. So as long as you download, you can get a JSON. So you can easily load into the, uh, the data frame, so uh, or data uh, RDEs. So it's really, as you said, the configuration. But configuration is not a part of the code. It's really just a, you know, as you, which part target and what the credentials are. So that's why I, I, I So that part I need to quite understand. You can write a write a plugin just for that. So my second part of the question is, uh, you write all these plugins. Uh, who's the target user? For it? Are you expecting the data science analyst to use this a lot to write these things, or are you just write a SQL? So so I'm a little confused at what we write the, the, the framework is supposed to be used. Oh, that, so okay. So uh, I'll answer your second question. Uh, so the question was. What is, who are the users that we're targeting here? Um, so the people we were really targeting are non-Scala people. Like, and the plugins are actually abstracted away from them. Like, those are things that the data platforms team is working on. Um, so 
the idea being that uh, the, a not, someone who doesn't know Scala and just wants to run a query or uh, do some simple data transformation, all they have to do is inject a service and call a simple method. Are they uh, programmers or analysts? So that's answer my question. Uh, I'm sorry, are they analysts or developers? Uh, they're, they're developers. They are developers. So uh, Gustav, the, the cat representation of Gustav, he is our analyst. So he is writing a little bit of code here, um, but we're mostly targeting our product teams, uh, developers on our product teams. So just a quick comment. I found that most of the users should be analysts. People writing SQL, Python, not programmers, because they write a style of code, and those are codes you teach or write rather than, they should just do configurations of Python SQLs. So they can write Spark SQLs, which is pretty standard, or Python, so which is either through uh, PySpark or, or just Python. So it was a little confusion. Right, yeah, so, um, so the answer to your question, the, the question is, uh, why aren't we, why isn't the data platforms team writing all the Scala code and the analyst is just uh, running the configuration? So the answer to that is because uh, we only had two people on the data platforms team and they, we just didn't have the resources to support all the use cases that uh, were being thrown at us across our product teams. So that's why we created the platform to try to enable them to write their own pipelines. That, that was sort of the genesis of that decision. Yes. Uh, for the machine learning pipeline, yes. I just have one question about the machine evaluation yes. box that you have. Yes. Does that support uh, capable cross validation? Uh, so we use the, um, uh, we use the basically the single split, right? Uh, I mean, it's just the, the two-fold validation. Uh, yeah, that's where we started. Uh, I believe one of our engineers looked into, like, I, I know Spark supports Kfold. Um, we looked into that, and I believe the answer was, uh, at our scale, there wasn't enough of a performance boost ongoing uh, with uh, k greater than two. Uh, so we just stuck with the regular, the cross validator, the train split. I forget what it's called. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Did I, did I repeat the question? You did not repeat that. Oh, I did not repeat that, sorry. The, the question was, uh, were we using k-fold uh, evaluator in the machine evaluation? Yes. Um, you talked about uh, uh, there was a self-documenting mix-in that you said you were taking advantage of the type safety. Uh, could you explain that again? I wasn't didn't quite catch what exactly you were uh, taking advantage of there. Oh, uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> so uh, with the, uh, yeah, it's the, the extractor has uh, very specific methods. So we'll say uh, extract from S3, or extract from Redshift, or extract from uh, MySQL. And uh, each of those methods takes in a configuration mix-in specific to that data source. So uh, a job has to be, uh, has to extend the correct data source. And if it doesn't, then we'll get a compiler error. Does that make, does that yeah, make yeah, sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Well, okay. Sense. So I, I think I forgot to repeat that question too. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Another question uh, regarding the feature stores. Yes. Where you store them? And your meta stores, uh, where you store them? Uh, the feature stores we store, uh, the question is uh, where, do we, where are feature stores we store them in S3? Yeah, the S3. metadata on iCard. Oh, yeah, the metadata also in S3. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, have we evaluated uh, systems other than Spark to that take advantage of plugins? 
Uh, the answer is no. We have not. Um, Right, uh, that's a good question. So the question was, why didn't we take advantage of um, an open source dependency management system um, like Airflow? And so the, 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 the answer is uh, we did put an engineer on uh, specifically Airflow trying to roll that out for a week. Um, he couldn't quite get it to work. Um, and so we sort of time, we just time box it. And we, and since sort of the need was very dire uh, to have insight into things that were failing, we just sort of rolled something very simple. Uh, the stuff that we, that we rolled out took, you know, 24 hours to produce. And um, it's actually something that I really want to go and do something about yeah. uh, because I tend to agree with you that yeah, there I'm are. I'm just curious because you, you mentioned like doing visualization that like all those tools have. Totally. Like, yeah, 100% agree. 100%. Yes. Um, so I have a curious about this idea that you mentioned of this auto deployment of the uh, auto all of this. Do you mind? Uh, so the question is, can I elaborate more on the auto deployment of machine learning models? Um, my, sh my short answer is no, because this is sort of something like that's in my head. Um, and, and I should also point out, I am, I am not a machine learning engineer by trade. Uh, so there may be people in the audience that know more about this subject than I do, and I'd be happy to meet you afterwards and learn from you. Um, but sort of the very generic idea is that uh, it, it, it's very manual and, and labor intensive to evaluate models right now and decide if they're worth deploying. And we want to create a system whereby machines can help us do that. So we're uh, setting baselines and for exceeding the baselines through like a K-folds evaluation that we're just going to auto-release the model into production. <clears throat> yes? How have you, have you been testing your code? I'm sorry? How do you test your work? <laughs> How do we test our work? Yeah. Uh, the question is, how do we test our work? Um, in terms of the Scala? Yeah, yeah, in terms of the Scala. Can you do a local learning laptop? What tools are you using? Yeah, so, so we, we actually do two things. Uh, one, we write the test, the end-to-end -end tests, like I talked about in the presentation. Um, but uh, we also have the ability to submit to our Spark. Like, we run dev clusters, if you noticed. Um, and so those clusters exist to be able to submit jobs from your laptop. And so sort of the general cadence is you create the, you um, uh, engineer the job, you write some tests for the job, make sure those are working properly. Uh, then you submit the job to a dev cluster, make sure it works properly there. Then you send it up for a code review. It gets reviewed and deployed to production. Cool. Yeah, no, no, no. question for, for a team and then we'll uh, Perfect, thank you. Great, uh, last question. Uh, so the question is, are there any plans on open sourcing this work? Uh, the, that has been broached and discussed. Uh, the short answer is no, there are no immediate plans. But um, 
I am an advocate of that. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll have to see what happens. You should blog about it. I know a really good website. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's right. Good points. All right. Thanks, everyone.